Hello everyone and welcome to the Speculative Wildlife Research Center, where we reimagine creatures and monsters from all realms of fiction through the lens of speculative biology. Today we will be looking at the harpies, the half-bird, half-woman monsters from Greek and Roman mythology. Harpies in mythology were born as personifications of the storm winds and were famous for their ravenous hunger, which would lead them to as most mythical monsters do, feast on humans like there was no tomorrow. Viciously violent, harpies would often carry away people, torture and punish them, or be otherwise used as a source of punishment by the gods themselves, many times by having them steal the food of people. As a recurring element in myth and culture of the time, even resurging nowadays in the realm of fantasy, it is clear that harpies have struck a chord with humanity's primal fears. That's why we will be taking this legendary hybrid and seeing what it would be like as a real living animal. Before we begin, I'd like to thank commenters Cines Dragon and Devon Lesser for suggesting this creature, which was a fun concept to work on. And remember, you too can leave your suggestions in the comments for future episodes. With how expansive the realm of fiction is, lots of creatures can escape my radar every now and then, so be sure to post any ideas you have in the comments below. I'd be happy to read them. Also, if you are enjoying these videos, please consider supporting the channel on Ko-fi, link available in the video's description. So, without further ado, let's get started. Today, we will go back to creatures that have haunted the nightmares of people since time immemorial, with the monstrous birds known as the harpies. These terrifying vultures inhabit the rocky islands near Greece, but will often travel inland while hunting. While most vultures have adapted quite well to their niche as carrion eaters, Many species of vulture will hunt small animals every now and then. The harpies, however, have adapted into an almost fully predatory lifestyle. The scientific name of harpies, Gymnegipus horribilis, is derived from the presence of fleshy wattles that hang from the head and neck of these creatures. While certainly ugly to look at, these wattles are extremely important to the survival of the harpy, since these creatures are quite big compared to other birds of prey and they live in a very hot, dry environment, unlike other creatures like the ropen, they can overheat very easily. These wattles give the harpy a greater naked skin surface to allow for more efficient heat dissipation. When the sun rises in the sky and heat becomes nearly unbearable, the harpies will rest near their cliffs and extend their wings, revealing another heat loss related adaptation. The body of harpies is nearly naked and plumage is very sparse, almost non existent on the bird's legs and chest. This not only lets the harpy lose heat more easily, but also makes its body much lighter than that of other, similarly sized birds. The body of a harpy, lacking plumage, looks gaunt and emaciated, further adding to the poor image of these creatures. Seeing them stand around with their wings extended, people near the area were given the impression that these creatures were guarding something. What they could be guarding as usually considered, could be nothing less than the gates to the underworld itself. What little plumage harpies have is a light grayish brown, quite similar to the color of the rocks and cliffs it inhabits. Harpies will blend into their habitat thanks to this camouflage, ensuring they stay unbothered. Males of the species, however, will develop a crest of bright reddish gold feathers as they mature. While they are normally held tightly against the harpy's neck, these long wavy feathers will undulate in the breeze when displayed 
acting as a signal to threaten and intimidate competitors for territory and females. While these feathers will not by themselves attract mates, they will ensure that territories frequented by females or better hunting areas are free of competition. Once mating season arrives, male harpies will begin inflating and displaying a pair of brightly colored gullar sacs, which are used as a part of their mating ritual. When hunting, harpies will attack small prey, such as rabbits, rodents and other species of bird. Harpies will soar in the wind currents, looking for prey from the heights. Once they have detected prey, they will plummet from high above and sink their talons into their prey with such speed that nothing short of storm winds could beat them to the catch. While their body is not as aerodynamic as that of birds such as falcons, their weight will help them gain great speeds while diving, and by opening their wings at the last second, they will stop the fall just in time for their claws to close around their prey. Harpies, however, will also hunt in pairs, forming either temporary alliances or joining their mate to catch bigger prey, such as deer, ibex, boars and, occasionally, even human beings. The two harpies will claw and beat their wings at their desired prey, pulling, pushing and striking with their sharp beak. While these strikes are hardly enough to seriously injure big prey, they will distract it long enough for the harpies to guide it towards the nearest cliff. Then, the harpies must only wait for it to finish falling, swoop down and feed on the flesh of their unfortunate victim. While very powerful birds, the idea that even two harpies could grab a fully grown human being and fly away with it are nothing but exaggerations of such behavior. While great hunters, harpies will not refuse an easy meal whenever it is available and will use similar tactics to scare away other animals to steal their food. In ancient times, harpies earned such bad fame from their appearance and hunting behavior that most people would fear them enough to stay away from their nesting sites. While these animals were never hunted or bothered by humanity at large, certain Greek and Roman cities learned to use them for their own purposes. Designated officials would walk to peaks preferred by the harpies and leave offerings of meat that had not been sold on time and would go to waste otherwise. Harpies would learn to covet that easy meal and would reunite around the peak whenever humans were nearby. Every once in a while, however, the offering left to the harpies would not be meat, but a criminal that had been sentenced to death. After having been robbed with pieces of meat, the criminal would look like nothing but more food to the harpies, which would fall on the criminal and drag them towards the nearest cliff. As can be imagined, such a fate was reserved only to those guilty of committing the worst crimes imaginable. Most civilized people, however, found the punishment excessively violent. Many, instead, would prefer to strand their criminals in islands inhabited by these birds, never to be seen again. And that's it for a speculative biology look into the harpies. With harpies, I found myself in a situation quite similar to the manticore's human face, but quite more difficult to resolve. While half human, what this half was actually like varied from story to story, being alternately described as either the face of a beautiful maiden or greatly emphasizing how ugly and disgusting they were. In the end, I decided to go with horrible since I believe it makes much more sense for a humanoid looking animal to veer towards scary rather than appealing. As for them being bolters, Roman poet Ovid beat me to that one, but it fit the mythical creature quite well.
Their viciousness and tendency to steal away food and people was easily explained by itself, but was still fun to see how well it adapted to a real living animal. Perhaps, like many other mythological monsters, the harpies originated as nothing but encounters with wild animals that became exaggerated and fantastical with time. I mean, if a bird swooped down and stole my food, I sure would be mad as well. Or, who knows, maybe fantastic creatures beyond our modern knowledge did actually roam the earth once. It's a really fun and creepy thing to think about. As with many legendary beings from the past and future episodes, it was a lot of fun to try to rationalize their legends, their relationships with gods and men, and their half-human visage into a real animal. I hope you guys enjoyed it as well and are raring to see more creatures like this in the future. If you do, just tell me in the comments below what creatures, mythical, fictional, from ancient legend or modern pop culture you would like to see. Thank you all for watching and see you next time on the Speculative Wildlife Research Center.